And so those of you who have your Bibles, please open up with me a familiar to us place of scripture that continues to keep the depths of the riches and knowledge of God. This is the book of Matthew 5, 45 and 48. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. The sermon that I would like to continue is called Called to Perfection. This promise contained in the commandment is the inheritance of the saints of all generations and the commandment of Christ is addressed specifically to students. Therefore, people who do not accept God's delegated authority over themselves have no part in the inheritance that is contained in this commandment and are not able to have it. Relevant to fulfilling this required commandment, we stop to study the purpose of the righteousness of God in the heart of a man, specifically the goals that the righteousness of God abiding within our heart is called to pursue. And in part we've been studying the purpose of the righteousness of God within our heart, received by us in the two broken tablets in which we died by the law, for the law, to live for the one that died and resurrected, and by doing so receive confirmation of our salvation in the new tablets of the covenant in the format of the law of the spirit of life, so that we provide God a basis to give us the promise to be heirs of peace not by the past law, but by the righteousness of faith like he gave it to Abraham and his seed. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Romans 4.13 We note that the righteousness of faith is determined by the obedience of our faith to the faith of God, which is presented in the preached word of God sent, together with the person who represents the fatherhood of God to us because every time I will remind us God's faith is information that comes from the preached word of God when we receive it we can then control then our emotional horse to the goal that God has placed before us to destroy the stronghold of death within our body and erect the stronghold of life. Therefore, the promise of the peace of God is given only to those men that are obedient to the order of God in accordance to which God sends us His word by the mouth of His delegated people. Therefore, the covenant of peace within the heart of man is the result of the obedience of his faith to the faith of God, which this, which are the spoken words of God's delegated ones. In a specific format, we've already looked at six signs by which we need to determine and examine ourselves as to whether we are sons of peace as well as the sons of God and have been studying the seventh sign. The seventh sign is our ability to clothe our essence into the holy and selective love of God. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Colossians 3, 14, 15. We have noted that according to this place of scripture, and it's not the only one, the reign of the peace of God within our heart is possible only upon one condition, and that is if the selective love of God or the holy love of God will abide within our heart and if we will be clothed into the selective love of God. Again, I will remind us why this word holy love I, why I call it selective because holy it separates the one from the other and doesn't love all the same it separates the pure from impure and loves the pure God loves the righteous one hates the lawless one and so when he shines his sun upon the righteous and unrighteous then the righteous he blesses uh, caressing them with his the warmth of his sun but the unclean he burns with his holiness the same rains that are poured out upon the righteous and unrighteous 
it, uh, the rain show or provide mercy and <coughs> goodness for the people and the other it drowns just like he did in the flood so don't uh, create illusions in your mind that God loves all the same and that he shines sun, his sun upon the all the same and the rain that he pours it upon all the same even here physically in the world you see how some areas of the world have uh, very uh, hot, it has very hot temperatures like Africa, and you'd say, why did God decide to shine or bur have such uh, uh, heat? Uh, there's not a place on earth that has so many mu uh, magicians and uh, idols and all kinds of witchcraft uh, and other places also that are very very dry a uh, country is blessed because of the church that's in the country if the church will behave itself correctly and be a light of the world because of the church God will bless the country see what happens with the country and according to that country, you'll, by its uh, well-being, you can judge according to the church that's there. If the church is good, correct before God, then the church will be blessed for the sake of that church. You remember when Abraham, there were cities uh, there were cities like Europe that were very tolerant where they agreed uh, the in uh, men with men being together and women with women being together and Abraham uh, was pleading God because Lot lived amongst Sodom and Gomorrah and so he asked if there are 50 righteous men will you uh, sp save uh, the country because of these people he says yes he says what what if there's not 50 what if there's 45 for the sake of 45 God says I will sa save that country what if there's 40 and and then God stopped and said and God remembered Abraham and led Lot out from Sodom you see, because of the prayer of Abraham, God leads a lot out from Sodom. I think that if there were 50 righteous men in Ukraine, there would not have been this kind of uh, a poverty that has come upon them today. And it's the same thing with other countries. If there were at least 50 righteous men, that means that the people that are there call themselves righteous, but they're not righteous. It's not possible that the righteous would be uh, on the side of fascist ideology and it, the righteous would not be able, wouldn't be saying that they're... Uh, following the Bandera way instead of the way of Jesus Christ. And so, unfortunately, we see where this country has turned. Maybe the saints now will begin to repent. Almost all Protestants, Pentecostal, those of the Pentecostal faith, those all have uh, agreed to this uh, government turnover with the exception, uh, of course, of the Orthodox. In Solomon it's written, My son, never agree with those who confront the king. Whether they call it a president or whatever, it's a, he, this is a king. There's no authority not placed by God. It doesn't matter how this authority has been placed, whether it's by vote, or just giving, uh, passing one from another, God placed the authority. That kind of country there is, the kind of authority you'll have, the kind of government you'll have. Right now we're talking about the fact that the rule of the peace of God can only in the heart of the one that 
has a holy love or clothed into the holy and selective love of God that understands that God's love loves the righteous and hates the sinner. In the selective love of God, which is the atmosphere of the peace of God, we see concealed the good, wonderful, eternal, and un uncomprehending for the human mind goals and works of God called to build a unique and peaceful relationship between God and His children, exclusively with His children. Jesus loved His church and committed Himself for her, purifying her with pure waters by the Word, so she be holy and without blemish with <coughs> in love before Him for His church. When Joseph was in doubt of his wife, of his future wife Mary, because she became pregnant before they were together, the angel came to him in the night. He said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the one that is born, that's going to be born of her will be of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call him Emmanuel, which is God is with us and he will save his people from their sins. Not the whole world, but his people from their sins. This I'm saying to those holy people that, that say that God loves everyone. God does not love everyone. God does not love everyone. He can't love those that mock his children that persecute his children tell me if your child will come bruised and hurt to you and you ask him son what happened he says the neighbor boy uh, beat him up are you gonna love this boy this neighbor boy I doubt it I think you all that tolerant love will disappear why do you decide then that God will behave when his children when people will be mocking them and hurting and so that you then convince yourself God loves them too those who touch you touch the apple of my eye I will give nations for you he paid a price for us the price of his son and you say that he loves everyone he loves us he gave the price of his son and the death of his son will be salvation for one and for the other will be judgment in scripture the character of the selective love of God is presented by the Holy Spirit in scripture by the preached word of the apostles and prophets in the form of seven unchanging elements and these are virtue knowledge self-control before doing any kind of good work you need to have the knowledge about it and then possibly have self-control not just to have self-control but also show perseverance and then in perseverance demonstrate your godliness and in and godliness is when you do good according to faith because godliness is to visit the widow and fatherless <coughs> in their hardship those widows and fatherless that are with you brotherly kindness not love to the world but brotherly kindness do not love the world or what's in it for everything that's in the world is the lust of the eyes the world is condemned God is not planning to save the world the world is condemned he's not planning to save any country they are condemned only ignorance of the evangelists that yell that Africa will be saved, Japan will be saved, Ukraine will be saved, America will be saved. All countries of the world are condemned to be destroyed. They're already condemned, and God is unchanging in His words. But He will save His people in these countries. He will save them by His preached word and brotherly kindness and love you can find these in second peter one two through eight and each of the seven qualities of the fruits of virtue are in one the other contain the characteristics of all the other qualities which is why they flow one from the other complete one the other strengthen one the other and confirm the truthful nature of one the other second these qualities these seven characteristics are called to be the moral perfection within our heart and an example inherent to the essence of God these seven qualities speak about the nature of the Heavenly Father 
demonstrate the qualities and we need to have the same nature to be perfect is to have the same nature the same atmosphere as the Heavenly Father third the given qualities are the great and precious promises entrusted to us through Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ Fourth, the given qualities presented in the seven characteristics are the imperishable treasure and unsearchable wealth of Christ with which we need to become rich. Fifth, in order to receive the inheritance of these qualities, these seven unchanging characteristics, it is necessary for us to receive the power of the Holy Spirit as the Lord and Master of our life, reminding us that when we receive, when we are baptized by the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, we aren't receiving at this time the Holy Spirit as the Lord and Master of our life for the reason that we are still infants and still are not able to be led by the Holy Spirit at the time because infants are attracted by all different doctrine and so the Holy Spirit is the Lord he comes later baptism of the Holy Spirit is the work of the Holy Spirit that is done in man that a person can use it is given to him so that he can separate his soul from his from his spirit and he receives the ability to speak in tongues your spirit then ha can then use your mouth to pray to God so that your mind not understand what you're saying but that does not yet mean that you've received the Holy Spirit as the Lord and Master of your life Eleazar the symbol of the Holy Spirit he comes to Mesopotamia and only one receives him as Lord and Master and that's Rebecca and all others received gifts but he uh, performs baptism he separates her from his nation from her house and takes her away and the rest remain with their gifts and so we know that many churches that speak in tongues they consider the Lord the Holy Spirit as their guest not as the Lord and their master they before they begin the service they say brothers and sisters now let us invite the Holy Spirit and then when they finish the service they are not with the Holy Spirit this very understanding that he is a guest and I often say being a young man I understood that there was something wrong I came up and asked that pastor or Episcopal you said that we invite the Holy Spirit as a guest but after the service you leave and he is where and they respond don't be spreading around heretic ideas he considered this heretic uh, idea that they invite him as a guest but then leave him after the service and that's how it is they invite him he comes and leaves that's what happens with one born of the spirit but one who is born of the throne he does not come and leave he now comes as a master he comes at the door and knocks if anyone opens the door I will come in and dine with him and he with me the Holy Spirit will never knock upon the door of an unwise Christian an infant he will knock only upon the heart of a person who has been grown into full measure of growth in Christ only there will he knock as a master this doesn't belong to the world the book of revelations is not for the world the gospel is the kingdom of heaven and we need to understand that sixth the means that we are to use or utilize for receiving the power of the Holy Spirit as the Lord and master of our life is the obedience of our faith to the faith of God and seventh by inheriting these great and precious promises in the form of the fruits of our spirit we become a part of God's divine nature literally which is why the confessions of the faith of our heart become equal in power to the words that come out of the mouth of God 
Since the selective love of God demonstrated in the seven unchanging qualities and characteristics have nothing in common with and cannot have anything in common with the nature of human love that is filled with egoism, greed, and is just temporary. Say in the Russian language, love is just the word love. I love chocolate, I love God, I love my wife, I love my children. And this is all the same one word. But in the ancient languages, God, a love for God had one word, a love for their spouse was a different word, a love for the friends, for a friend was a different word. Filio, love for friends, Dorgi, a love, relative love. Eros, a love of a man and a woman. And agape, which is a love for God. And these types of love, the all others are egotistical, with the exception of agape. They are greed, filled with egoism and greed and are temporary. But when we have the love agape, it as a crown, and it then takes these three forms of love, the other ones can, uh, disciplines them and directs them properly, does not allow uh, these other evil qualities to be there and be demonstrated in them. Only for these other three you could say that you can love foolishly. And the saying that lo love is blind is something that uh, can be said about the other qualities with the exception of the love agape. It is the power of the selective love of God in the format of seven qualities of unearthly virtue that is called to enthrone the resurrection of Christ in our earthly bodies and clothe our earthly body into the resurrection of Christ that is into our new person. These are the bond of perfection of the selective love of God. And this bond of perfection of the selective love of God is unconditional when it comes to the seven qualities of virtue, and unlike the tolerant and egotistical love of man, the unconditional nature of the selective love of God and the seven qualities of virtue is different in that it contains the burning jealousy of God, all his knowledge and his absolute wisdom, that in no way is able to be used for greedy and egotistical purposes and goals of a man. At the same time, the tolerant love of man toward other men is very conveniently used for greedy and egotistical goals and purposes. Here's what the scriptures say regarding the strength of the love of God. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. Songs of Solomon 8, 6, 7 we know that the in scripture the measure of the love of God is identified by and is known by the measure of God's hatred toward evil and men who do this evil the love of God is always proportionate to the hatred of God toward all that is resisting him you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Hebrews 1 9. This is taken from the 45th Psalm. In the original, this doesn't sound abstract. Our, in our translation, it's as if God loved. God has loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. But there's no abstract righteousness or lawlessness. To love righteousness, you can love it within those who carry righteousness, or you can hate lawlessness in those who carry this lawlessness. And so you hate lawlessness in carriers again of law, uh, of laws in those who carry this lawlessness. Psalm 11, 5, 6, and 5 through 7. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous, he loves righteousness, his countenance beholds the upright. And you may ask, well, what about sinners? Does God love the, the sinner? God loves a repenting sinner. 
God loves the sinner that wants to be free from sin and suffers because of this sin. God loves those, but God does not love those who drink sin as cold water and don't want to come to God, don't fe- uh, experience uh, guilt. But he loves those uh, sinners that understand that they're in the nets of sin and want to be free. These are those he loves. Because because since they want to be free, that means they're not actually sinners, they just fell into sin. Sinners, by nature, do not want to be free from sin. This is their atmosphere, this is where they are. But those who want to be free from sin are people that are gods. God loves those. And will find a way to break these chains and bring him out from this burning fire of his lusts and desires. Only loving what God loves and hating what God hates, we are able to demonstrate God's perfection in his reaction toward the righteous who perform good and the unrighteous who perform lawlessness. The selective love of God by its unchanging nature in the form of seven supernatural qualities is called to grow us into the fullness of growth in Christ or lead us into the perfection that is like the perfection of our Heavenly Father so that we can shine the light of our Son upon ju- the just and unjust and pour out our reigns according to, according to God's intentions upon the righteous for good and the unrighteous to punish them. Considering, therefore, that these seven qualities of virtue identifying the selective love of God do not have an analog in the earthly realm of the human lexicon that is in any dictionary of the world. The love of God is the foundation and atmosphere of the moral and immovable law, opening within our heart the essence of God and the essence of the heavenly kingdom. And this is not all. The love of God agape is a sovereign love, which is unconditional when it comes to the people it chooses, in its abilities to foreknow and predestine. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of a son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, Romans 8.29. When it says foreknew, that means he saw before the creation of the world every one of us that at a specific time of our life, when we hear the truth, we will run to it and attempt to be f- become free of sin. And these are the ones that he foreknew and predestined. We choose for ourselves the life, life or death. We choose blessing and curses. It's not God who determines and condemns us to destruction. It's we ourselves that choose it by our mouth. By the words of your mouth, you are justified and condemned. And so, if we will confess the faith of God that abides within our heart, then these words will catch us into this net and just justify us. And this will be in the kingdom of heaven. Because of its sovereignty, the selective love of God never violates the sovereign rights of those people she selects and never allows her own sovereign rights within her boundaries to be violated. These boundaries identified as burning holiness. In a specific format, we've already looked at the demonstration of the selective love of God in the qualities of virtue, knowledge, self-control, and perseverance and stopped to study the virtue of the love of God in the mystery of great godliness. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. 1 Timothy 3.16 And so God has shown all of this by his uh, students. Therefore, by demonstrating the signs of the fruits of godliness, we identify the true quality of the love of God agape within the heart of a man, in his words, his actions, and the manner in which he dresses, which isn't supposed to prompt the instincts of the opposite gender. 
We need to dress in a way not to prompt the instincts of the opposite gender. Especially when we come to God to worship, we need to dress in classical festive clothing that shouldn't be too tight or revealing certain in intimate uh, pl uh, places of our body. We need to show where we came. Further, we note that there is a fundamental difference between the goodness of God in his favor toward man and the godliness of a man which he is called to demonstrate in his love to God. For example, the godliness of a man is his favor for God. I will remind us that God's favor is his responsive is his response, his uh, come to, uh, draw me near to me and I will draw near to you. First God says, if you see the light and you will come to the light, I will immediately come to you. Even if you've gotten lost and turned away from me but understood this, that you have fallen into a net of sin and if you attempt to turn back to me I will immediately come to greet you and he never closes the door from one that walks away the son that walks away the, the door from God's side remained opened it's the son that had closed the door behind him and left but the father left it open and when the son understood that he had made a big mistake, he began to repent and said, I will go to my father. Maybe he will forgive me and will allow me to at least be amongst his servants. And when the father saw him, it's written that he ran to greet him. And you sometimes hear these preachers say, make a step, one step to God, he'll make two towards you. How foolish and how unjust. Can you count how many steps the father took when he was running toward his son? God's love is immeasurable. You cannot count it in steps. It's above God's love or a man's love. And so what does he do when a person repents? He, the son said, I will come and tell him that I am not worthy to be his son, but allow me to be at least amongst your servants. He didn't even, he couldn't even tell his father that he didn't have the chance because the father ran to him in the original why did this was the son unable to tell him these things because the father covered him with his kisses and held him and hugged him and didn't listen to the things he needed to tell him he turned to his servants quickly bring me new garments justification shoes upon his feet light for the world a ring upon the finger this is a you're a royal son and slaughter the best of the lamb we will sing of the lambs and we will sing and rejoice for my son was dead and lost and has been found the angels in heaven rejoice uh, and it's not a sinner from the world but a child of God that fell and returned in the parable it says if someone lost if, if, they ha if someone had a hundred sh uh, sheep and lost the one then he will leave the 99 and go seek the one this is not the people of the world these are people of God that have fell into a net or possibly thorns uh, or fornication or drugs or whatever other form or type of sin it makes no difference but God in this way wants to show that when a person comes to God, he 
sees this as favor to toward him. And so God's uh, uh, God, the godliness of a man is his favor for God, a man's grace for God, and his thanksgiving when we come to God we come to take what God has placed upon our account in Jesus Christ that he redeemed us not that he will save us but he saved us in Jesus Christ we need to come and take that salvation but come upon, come upon his conditions the godliness of a man is the ability of a person to visit the fatherless and widow in their hardship and keep yourself from being defiled by the world the godliness of a man is the ability to imitate Christ and meditate about the things of the hills, see God in his good, acceptable, and perfect will. The godliness of God is his response to the favor that a man has shown him. This is his responsive reaction, his goodness, his favor and his grace, his mercifulness when it, toward man, his thanksgiving toward man, his good work and good acts toward man. One of the f words favor is thanksgiving, his good work, good acts, his kindness in the absolute sense of the word. The Old as well as the New Testament identified the virtue of the love of God and the discipline of godliness as one of the greatest mysteries of God himself, which defends and makes the sincere love of God impossible for counterfeit and falsification. Aside from these characteristics called to identify the character of godliness, there is also a counterfeit form within the church, a counterfeit form of godliness that exists as well, that conflicts with and resists the true form of godliness. Having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away 2 Timothy 3 5 if you see your pastor has the look of godliness leave that church and pray to God to find a church where there is a pastor that does not just have a look of godliness in one uh, Pente Pentecostal church I was, and they had a brotherly council in that church. I was in that church, and there was a man I was communicating with, and I explained to him that God can't bear sinners. That when a person repents and receives Jesus, he is born from God, he becomes holy and righteous by the fact of his birth not by the fact of the f of doing righteous work, sanctifying himself, but by the fact of repentance. A bear can't bear a donkey or a donkey, a fox. A dove can't uh, lay eggs uh, of, of, of a serpent. But here it turns out that they, they admit that they're born from God, but you ask them, are you holy? No. Are you righteous? No. And so when he suddenly understood he's holy and righteous, he began to uh, jump from joy. And he was so glad, he told, and he said, brothers, and the brothers looked at him in a weird way, and he says, brothers, you, you're holy, you're righteous. They became uncomfortable, and their leader became very uncomfortable and looked at the other brothers and said, this is provocation, he said. How arrogant you have to be to say that you are holy and righteous. We don't refuse holiness and righteousness. We want it. We desire it. Yes, we don't have this, but we don't reject it. I'm sorry, why are you... If you don't have it, then you don't have it. And those who don't have it are those who have rejected it. From such people turn away, it's written. If we will not break our relationship with people that have the look of godliness and will not distance ourselves from them, then they will corrupt our godliness that is contained in our good habits, which is why we, together with them, will inherit the prepared for them destruction. 
relevant to this, we need to answer <coughs> four classical questions. First, what are the characteristics of both God and man in Scripture? What purpose does godliness have within the relationship of God with man and man with God? What conditions do we need to fulfill to collaborate our godliness with the godliness of God? And by what signs do we determine that our godliness is truly collaborating with the godliness of God? In a specific format, as much as the Lord has allowed in the measure of our faith, we have already looked at the first three questions and have been studying the fourth question. And by what signs do we determine that our godliness is truly collaborating with the godliness of God, and not some sort of counterfeit? The sign that we that we have been focused on, that we are collaborating our godliness with the goodness of God, is the ability to be the cloud of God filled with His moisture and scattering His light that it turn, so that it turns by His guidance for punishment and for good. And with moisture He saturates the thick clouds, He scatters His bright clouds, and they swirl about being turned by His guidance that they may do whatever he commands them on the face of the whole earth. He causes it to come whether for correction or for his land or for mercy. Listen to this, O Job, stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Do you know when God dispatched them and caused the light to his clouds, the light of his clouds to shine? Do you know how the clouds are balanced, those wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge? Job 37, 11 through 16. This means, again, and so these, the, reading this place of scripture, this is a very important element by which we need to examine ourselves, whether we collaborate our godliness with God's godliness. Apostle Paul writes in Romans 11:22. therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity but toward you goodness. This is completely in accordance to what's written in the book of Job. He sends his clouds for mercy, for punishment. You consider goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity but toward you goodness if you continue in his goodness otherwise you also will be cut off Romans 11:22, demonstrating God's goodness to the one and God's severity on the other we become the carriers of his justice in the bound within the boundaries of holiness or his clouds that carry light and uh, moisture the phrase, do you know, when, when God dispatched them and caused the light of his cloud to shine, indicates the fact that not all clouds are able to be clouds that God dispatches and causes the light of, to shine, but only those clouds which provide God a basis to contain his moisture in themselves. This is confirmed by another place of scripture. God God, he, him, he binds up the water in his thick clouds, yet the clouds are not broken under it. He covers the face of his throne and spreads his cloud over it. Job 26, 8, 9. You know, you've seen clouds uh, that often are filled with moisture and others that are not. And to differentiate the clouds of the Most High in the form of the saints that fear God from profane to his nature clouds in the form of pseudo-saints not having in themselves the fear of the Lord, it is necessary for us to know that our ability to provide God the basis to fill us with his moisture and our readiness to scatter his light and direct them according to his instructions is our function. By fulfilling this function, we demonstrate our favor to God. The function to fill us with moisture so that we can be led by the Holy Spirit and be directed by his instructions is God's favor, which is his response to our for him favor, demonstrated in our readiness to be filled with his moisture that is our hunger and thirst to hear the preached word of truth. God fills with hunger and thirst the heart. If the heart does not hunger and thirst for his word, then God will not fill such a heart and will not be able to put his wisdom in such a heart. And to examine ourselves as to whether we truly are in accordance to the demands of the clouds of God, capable of collaborating our godliness with his favor so that we can provide him a basis to fill us with 
the moisture of the Holy Spirit so that we can be led by the Holy Spirit and be ready to be uh, working according to His instructions. First, we need to determine how we identify according to Scripture the requirements necessary for us to be in accordance to the demands of the clouds of the Most High filled with His moisture and scattered and scattered light. Second, what purpose do we fulfill in the form of the clouds of the Heavenly Father filled with His moisture and scattering His light? Third, what conditions do we need to fulfill so that God establish us in the form of His clouds so that we are able to be filled with His moisture and scatter His, clou- his light? By what signs do we determine that we truly are the clouds of the Most High capable of being filled with His moisture to scatter His light and be moving by the wind of the Holy Spirit according to God's desire for punishment or favor or mercy? Responding to these questions, we've noted that the essence of this allegory contains the eternal goals of God, His intention, which is our purpose and our calling. These are first to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. It is necessary to scatter your light from your cloud upon the righteous and unrighteous and uh, pour out your rains upon the righteous and unrighteous. Second, we are called to pour out the moisture of the Heavenly Father in rains and scatter His light according to His desire and not our own, uh, our own desire or our own opinion. In the New Testament, the purpose of the clouds of God, <coughs> first many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God, Romans 8, 14. This means that if we are in accordance to the demands of the clouds of God to be filled with His moisture and scatter His light, for the one a punishment, for the other a blessing, then our if we are not able to do these things, then our uh, sonhood or our adoption is under question. In a specific format, we've already looked at five of seven signs that are contained in the first question. In short formulations, I'll remind us of their characteristic. Those uh, clouds are without moisture, we have been looking at as the category of people in the church that do not have the Spirit of God and are resisting the Spirit of God, although they speak in tongues, because accord, because of their uh, state, they are attracted by all kinds of uh, teachings and those that are filled with God's moisture are the people that are being led by the Holy Spirit and are led by the new person and this means that the clouds of the Most High can only be those saints that have grown into full measure of growth in Christ Jesus and have become according to the requirement of God's perfection further we note that the clouds of the Most High that are within his uh, possession are a symbol of his great mystery and are called to fulfill the destiny role of and the work of adopting us and redeeming our body from the law of sin and death. The cloud of the Most High in Scripture is a symbol of the glory of God, the place where God abides, the clothes into which God dresses, and the midst from which the Lord speaks. Second, the clouds of the Most High in Scripture are the garments of the seas when it came out as if from his entrails. The cloud of the Most High in Scripture is the glory of God that comes from the north in the form of raging fire. Then I looked and behold a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself, and brightness was all around it and radiating out of its midst like the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Ezekiel 1.4 For the cloud of the Most High in the form of His glory is presented in Scripture in the category of those saints in the bodies of which God has reigned, and they became a joy for all of the good of all good lands and islands. The cloud of the Most High in the form of the glory of the Lord is presented in Scripture in those category of saints that by the law died for the law, which is why their bodies became a symbol of the tabernacle of testimony where Moses as the servant of the Old Testament was not able to enter when the cloud was when the cloud of glory filled it <coughs> the glory of God that is upon the face of Moses was not the glory that was 
uh, in the tabernacle or the cloud of glory that was in the tabernacle, which is a service of justification. Upon the face of Moses, there was a glory. This was the service of condemnation. And so he was not able to enter there with the shining, with the glory of the service of condemnation. He was a servant of the Old Testament, not the New. To be able to enter, you needed to be of the New Testament. <coughs> the cloud of the Most High in the form of the glory of the Lord presented in Scripture as the cloud of fragrance, where God revealed himself to Aaron and that protected Aaron from death, as he, being a servant of the Old Testament, was not in accordance to the demands of the fragrant cloud of the glory of the Lord, which is why he needed to create this cloud but not be it. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come as, as just any time into the holy place inside the veil, before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die, for I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Then he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord, with his hands full of sweet incense beaten fine, and bring it inside the veil. And he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, lest he die. Leviticus 16, 2 through 13. The fragrant cloud of glory where the Lord reveals himself <coughs> and where God protected those from death who came to him is a symbol of the saints who are a symbol of the cloud of the fragrance of Christ. That for one is a <coughs> a frag a odor of death and to the other an odor of life. Now thanks be to the God who always led us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as so many peddling the word of God but as of sincerity but as from God we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Second Corinthians 2.14-17 and so you can see the saints are called to be that same cloud that protected in his time Aaron the servant of the Old Testament so he not die this cloud is called to protect our body where the law of sin and death is so God not destroy our body until we by the power of confession of the faith that's in our heart destroy the stronghold of death that is within our body and then all of the aspect of, of, of us will become a fragrance of Christ all three aspects of us and then the poor will be that person uh, that will try to do something to these people even thinking evil against this person he will need to be destroyed people before rapture in the bodies whose str the stronghold of death will be destroyed and the stronghold of life will be erected will have the immune system of the Holy Spirit and they will not be able to be touched anyone who t tries to touch them will be destroyed and they will not be able to die because they will be these people will be immortal and they will this will be testimony that they will meet the Lord in the air Seventh, the cloud of the Most High in the form of the glory of the Lord is presented in Scripture as the <coughs> chariot of the Most High being moved by the wings of the wind. So that you could elect, erect within the bodies the holy stronghold of righteousness. Psalm 104, 2 3 and 35, who cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters, who makes the cloud his chariot, who walks on the wings of the wind. May, may sinners be consumed from the earth and the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul, praise the Lord. 
in order for the sinners beca- to be consumed from the earth and wicked be no more is possible when in the body of a person the stronghold of death will be destroyed and all the works of the old person will be d- destroyed and the stronghold of resurrection and so the phrase of this psalm the ending phrase where it says may the sinners be consumed from the earth and the wicked be no more indicates to the the fact that God makes the clouds his chariot and is moved by the wings of the wind that is his Holy Spirit because the wings of the Most High is the truth of, of, of the teaching of Christ and the Holy Spirit that reveals this teaching in the heart of man. And God pursues one goal, to destroy the sinners from the earth, and this goal is the coming of Christ, so he may reign here for a thousand years. <coughs> now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God Revelations 19 11 through 15 when the Lord comes to reign for a thousand years upon horses white horses this time not upon a donkey but upon a white horse symbol of battle he will destroy all the sinners of the earth and he will do this together with his bride that will follow him second what question or second question what purpose do we fulfill in the form of of the clouds of the heavenly father filled with his moisture and scattering his lights being a cloud of the heavenly father being filled with his moisture and scattering his light we are called to become the atmosphere of the glory of the lord in the temple in which he abides. And it came to pass when the priests came out of the heavenly place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon spoke. The Lord said he would dwell in the dark cloud. I have surely built you an exalted house and a place for you to dwell forever. 1 Kings 8, 10 through 13. If in the Church of Saints there are no people that possess the status of apostles and prophets that are placed by God to carry responsibility for His Church, then this means that the Church in which we are cannot be called or be holy or a place from where God turns to His nation. Because Apostle Paul wrote, For all the promises of of God in him are yes, and in him amen to the glory of God through us. All of the promises that a person can receive, they truly are yes and an amen in Jesus Christ, and can be received only through the apostles and prophets that are placed by God, and not those that are voted for, or those who have placed themselves. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us in God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Which is why the priests of the Old Testament were not able to enter the temple when the glory of God filled it, because this was the glory of justification. God always showed the symbols of justification, not like at the fact that the law condemned man, it was a symbol of justification. All the symbols that were there, they were given so that when the time comes of the New Testament to take these examples and see that the goal of God was to justify his children. Justify his family, give hope. Although the children sit in the church, but their hearts are a cemetery of promises. And they believe that when they go to heaven, there they will understand everything, and there they will receive the promises. You won't need those there. 
We need these promises here. We need our heart not to be a cemetery of promises, but a temple of God, where these promises live. And so the goal of God is to resurrect within our heart the promises that God can deliver you from that situation in which you are. He sees your pain and He does not condemn you for the sin that you are in. It's Satan that condemns you and your conscience. But the Holy Spirit, His goal is not to condemn, but to help a person and tell you, you can come out. I could call you out, but you need to do something for this. You don't need to do anything special, but acknowledge that you're, you've sinned and, that, and you need to come to me and I will deliver you. I continue to love you. And so when our child falls, and hurts his knee we don't throw him out and say you are no longer my son we it's the opposite we pick him up we begin to heal his uh, attend to his wounds when a child of God falls into sin the devil begins to condemn the Lord does not condemn you because you are his child he perfectly understands why you fell and he wants to give you that truth so you can receive it and not fall again and not let the Father's hand go which is why be attentive to that voice you're not just in this place you didn't just end up here by accident this is the work of the Holy Spirit and it's not important who invited you here or how you came here but if you fell, if you ended up here, then that means that the Lord, upon this place, wants to restore His relationship with you that you broke. He is faithful to His promise and wants to continue to fulfill His covenant. For your sin, the price is paid. You don't need to pay anything. You need to receive justification. Possibly you've never received it previously. Possibly you've been earning your justification, which is why you fall. Often people who try to earn their justification sooner or later will fall. But it's some. Those who earn their justification and those who fall actually are lucky people. They will be able to see that they fell and will begin, begin to seek the right way. But those who continue to justify themselves with their works will never know that they are in the nets of the devil. This is a very surprising moment when the Holy Spirit works within the heart of man. He works in him because his heart belongs to him. When an unusual warmth, supernatural warmth of the Holy Spirit suddenly vis uh, is in the heart of man or begins to be sensed in the heart of man that, and a person begins to understand that he is able to be forgiven a person convinces himself that he's committed such a sin that he can never be forgiven for this is a lie of Satan if you feel bad that you fell that means that God can forgive you and wants to forgive you and so right now we are going to pray and all those who desire to resist sin fear those situations, circumstances you're in, illnesses that are before you, you don't want to die, you want to live. God also wants you to live. On your account, He's placed healing, and you can receive it, because when God releases your sins and forgives you, you receive healing. He sent his son in Bethesda to one person who 40 years was sick and 40 years could not acknowledge, admit that he was guilty and it wasn't because the church was bad or the pastor was bad or the parents did not raise him right or that the circumstances are the way they are. Finally, he understood that he was the one that was guilty and began to repent and then the Lord told him, Jesus, 40 years I've been waiting, finally he repented, go and heal him. He goes and heals him alone, and he says, go and sin no more. This means that his illness was a result of his sins. God never heals a person from sin if a person does not repent from that sin. 
Let us bend our knees and pray. And I wait for you here at the altar. The Holy Spirit desires here to see your action, your decision. Come here and we'll pray for you and believe that God loves you. He is upon this place to destroy the stronghold of death within your body, destroy illnesses in your body, restore your relationship, his relationship with you. I am going to be praying your prayer and I ask you to deeply believe that upon this place you are not here accidentally the Lord loves you and right now he is able to forgive you to justify you to throw your lawlessness behind his shoulders, separate it as the east is from the west and not for, uh, remember them again. He has enough strength for this. He has the ability to remove your shame that you're in. He can restore you. Close your eyes. This is your secret room. Lift your hands to God. This is a sign that you, your hands are spread out to Him without doubt and without anger. Pray together with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I come to you with a wound in my heart. My heart is broken. I am in sin. I ask you, forgive me, wash me, cleanse my heart from sin. I love you. I am tired of sin. I come to you. I have opened my heart. I have received your words. May they obtain strength. The blood of the covenant, may it cleanse my heart. I accept your truth into my heart. And right now, before heaven and hell, I want to proclaim that in accordance to your words, I am washed, I am cleansed, I am healed, I am restored, I am justified, and I am saved. Your sins are forgiven and your trespasses in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you. May he look upon you with his great face and show you mercy and give you peace. May thousands and ten thousands attempt to come near you, but they won't touch you. May all these blessings be upon you and upon your children. May this blessing of heaven, a blessing of the ancient valleys and hills be on you. May the stronghold of death be destroyed in your body and with noise be cast into hell. And may the stronghold of life be put in its place. May this all be upon you and upon your children and be fulfilled upon you. And the nation shall say, Amen. Blessed be the Lord in the name of Jesus Christ, you are justified. And this is not questioned, this is not emotions, this is information. You need to know that God has justified you, He has restored you, and your relationship with Him. He will never again remember your lawless works even if you need to do something again that is unpleasant to say Lord I've sinned he'll say son or daughter I don't remember the sins that you've done previously only this one because what the Lord has forgiven he blots out of his memory please remember that don't believe the devil you are free you can again serve the Lord rejoice before him study the truth and the Lord will be with you let us proclaim our unchanging manifestation now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling 
and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.